That's got to mean something, right? The pastor's got to do all that before they get started. May not be a good sign for the sermon. Uh, you know, or maybe it's just that, you know, you got to get a little pumped up. Maybe it's just that I need a little exercise today. I'm not sure which one it is. I guess we'll find out, though. Today's scripture reading has two references to prayer. One is from Paul's letter to the Romans, in which he says in our prayers, because we don't always pray. The other one is the prayer of Solomon, who does pray as he should. In this passage, God comes to Solomon in a dream, much like God came to Jacob in a dream in our reading last week, the passage about Jacob's ladder. In this dream, God comes to Solomon and almost like a genie tells Solomon to pray for something. What is it you would have me give you? So Solomon prays for wisdom and God grants it saying, because you have asked this and not asked for yourself long life or riches or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall rise after you. It's a wise person who asks for wisdom, though, isn't it? And I, I, this episode reminds me a little bit of The Wizard of Oz. Because if you haven't noticed, all the characters who ask for things in The Wizard of Oz kind of already have them. They're already there. Remember how the Tin Man asked for a heart, but he clearly cares for all the people around him? Even moved to tears at times, which makes him rust, and everybody has to use the oil can on him. Remember the Scarecrow who desperately wants a brain, but sometimes he seems to be the brain of the whole operation? Remember when he sees the chandelier that's going to fall on the soldiers or whatever, if he cut, just cuts this rope and he uses the tin man's axe to cut the rope and the whole thing falls down on him? Only a ruler who already possesses a good amount of wisdom will pray for an understanding and discerning mind so they could better discern and better care for their people. Can you imagine a politician today? Humbly asking for wisdom to make the right choices instead of ruin their political rivals. Or for more funds for their campaign. Or for more power. They might ask for the wisdom in public. But it doesn't really feel like that's being lived out in their private life, in their practices. It doesn't see the prayer of most people that are in power. So as is my normal habit in sermons, I want to turn the story back on us, back on ourselves, and locate where we are in this story. So I ask you, what are we praying for? Today in New Smyrna Beach, in Florida, in the United States, in the world, what is it that we would ask from God? Would we ask for wisdom to live in harmony and justice with each other? Or would we ask to be more comfortable in our own positions in life? Would we ask for our enemies, whether they're our political enemies or just like that annoying next door neighbor, to be defeated? Would we ask for more power at the expense of others? Earlier this month, the state of Florida rolled out its new state educational standards. It did not happen quietly or routinely as these things usually go. There was a lot of controversy involved with them, especially when it came to the history standards for everything, kindergarten through 12th grade, particularly when it gets to middle school. Some serious changes were made that could have some serious consequences in the way we handle the education of our young people. For one thing, it was not suggested, but mandated, the young people are taught that slaves learn trades that may have benefited them. The full standards for grades 6 through 8 reads like this. SS.68.AA.2.3 
Examine the various duties and trades performed by slaves, e.g. agricultural work, painting, carpentry, tailoring, domestic service, blacksmithing, transportation. Benchmark clarification one, instruct Instruction includes how slaves develop skills in which, in some circumstance, in some instances, could be applied for their personal benefit. People who were stolen away from their homes of families and continents, or who were ripped away from their mothers and sold on auction blocks, who were owned by other people as property, learned job skills while under the foot of slavery. Send your kids off to another continent so they can learn how to be a blacksmith or a painter or how to pick cotton. All it will cost them is their freedom. Maybe even their lives if they underperform or start demanding crazy things like freedom or basic human rights. Does that sound a little insane to you? I hope it does. Apparently it doesn't to the state of Florida. This is a true insult to people whose ancestors were slaves, right? Let me be clear, there's nothing positive that should be said about the institution of slavery. Nothing. It was brutal, it was inhumane, and it was evil. Especially the form of the, in the form of the transatlantic slave trade, which was even worse, as if slavery wasn't bad enough like in biblical times, in the Middle East and Rome, it was bad enough then, but this was even worse, this, tra this transatlantic slave trade. According to some scholars, people in Africa were actually often sought out because they had specific trade skills. They didn't come here and get enlightened by our great superior culture. They were living and working in a society of their own, in their own continent. What do you think they were doing? Just sitting around waiting for some great people to come from a foreign land to pluck them up out of savagery and save them from their poor primitive plight? That's the delusion of European and American paternalism, that we know what's best for everyone on the planet, and we are somehow still trying to add little lines in our educational system so that our kids remember what good Christians we are to rescue these people and teach them the superior ways in the West. And I've heard people declare to me before, can you believe that these people would never have learned about Jesus Christ if they hadn't become slaves? As if that somehow makes up for it? There is no argument that can ever justify the transatlantic slave trade or any form of slavery, not teaching people skills and especially not bringing them to the church. This change to the standards is small, but it is important. Because of this being written into the standards, that means that our middle school students will have to answer questions on state tests required for them to advance in school that indicate the slaves found a benefit to their bondage. There are many good things still in the standards, like learning about innovations that African Americans had to science, to the arts, and learning about the political and economic movements that reinforce the institution of slavery. There is still good stuff in those standards. But keeping little lines like this in our educational standards is refusing to fully repent from sins of the past. It's refusing to remember our shortcomings and learn from our past. Another little gem in the standards is this, SS.912.AA.3.6, describe the emergence, growth, destruction, and rebuilding of black communities during Reconstruction and beyond. Clarification two, instruction includes acts of violence perpetrated against and by African Americans, but is not limited to 1906 Atlanta race riot, 1919 Washington DC race riot, 1920 Oke Ocoee massacre, 1921 Tulsa massacre, and the 1923 Rosewood massacre. In case you don't know what the word massacre means, it means defenseless people getting killed, <laughs> not defenseless people fighting, right? like starting it. It, it. That's not what the word massacre means. Uh, I'm not familiar with all these events listed, I'll admit that, but a couple of them stand out, like the Tulsa massacre, which was the, in the news the past few years as a politically charged topic. 
Uh, we should pay attention to the Ocoee Massacre in 1920, because that's right here in Florida. The Orange County Regional History Center's website describes it this way. Quote, events unfolded on Election Day 1920 when Moses Norman, a black U.S. citizen, attempted to vote in Ocoee and was turned away from the polls. That evening, a mob of armed white men came to the home of his friend Judy, Julie Perry, or excuse me, of his friend Julie Perry, in an effort to locate Norman. Shooting ensued. Perry was captured and eventually lynched. An unknown number of African-American citizens were murdered, and their homes and communities were burned to the ground. Most of the black population of Ocoee fled, never to return. An article from the University of Central Florida's magazine called The Pegasus calls it one of the most horrific examples of racial hatred imaginable. But our students will have to learn that in this event, which was a massacre of dozens of black people in Jim Crow era hatred, Dead, and, deadly, and deadly voter suppression that destroyed an entire community, that it had violence on both sides. The history museums and university, the history of uni and history museums and universities, they see these events as pure evil, but our state says, eh, there were good people on both sides. Somehow, we're supposed to put a positive spin on the lynching of somewhere between 30 and 80 people. We don't actually know because records were not good, not complete. This happened not far from here in Florida. I can't imagine being a teacher and having to deal with this issue. However, I can't imagine being a preacher and dealing with this issue. I happen to be reading a book this week. Uh, it's called The Cross and the Lynching Tree by James Cone. And if you've never read it, it's, it's pretty intense, okay? So, I, you know, you had to think about it before you're going to read it. But it is intense. And it, he, but uh, James Cone is a professor and a theologian at Union Theological Seminary. He died about five years ago. But in this book, he examines the connection between the image of the tree, the lynching tree, and the cross of Jesus Christ. And how we in America, especially in white America, however, have managed to disconnect these two methods of ex execution in our minds. As a people, we are a people who venerate the cross of crucifixion and refuse to forget a man that hung there. But we often try desperately to forget the tree where so many black people have hung and died in our country. What a contradiction for a faith that is based around a man who is put to death by hanging on a tree, Acts 39, Acts 10, 39, we should connect to the horrors of suffering. But we try to forget it. We're in that empire that was actually hanging people, when we're that empire, when we're the Romans in the story. That connection is often lost on us. We're being, forgot we're being asked to forget the lynching tree. But forgetting the lynching tree is to forget the cross, to forget the struggles of an oppressed people. In case you haven't read the prophets in the Old Testament, let me sum up all of their teachings. God doesn't like it when you forget oppressed people. To forget the cross would be to forget Jesus our Savior. And to forget the lynching tree and all other terrors of slavery would be to forget the sanctity of the lives of black slaves. And if we forget the sanctity of the lives of black slaves, what is there to stop us from forgetting about the sanctity of, of the lives of black people today? Part of the horrors of both the cross and the lynching tree is that they're both designed not to be a device of torture, although they were certainly that. They were designed to be a warning deterrence to other people. In both cases, they were publicly humiliated and put on display. It was a method of deterrence. For the Romans, it was a way of saying, don't cross the empire. In the American South, it was a way of saying, don't cross the lines. Don't think you're equal with us, or this will happen to you too. People were beaten, sometimes stripped naked, sometimes castrated. Sometimes people took pictures of the broken body and then sold the pictures as keepsakes for all the poor souls that were unable to attend the lynching in person. 
But at least we taught them some really good trading skills, right? In a poem called, well, to demonstrate this, really how this was used as a deterrence method, in a poem called A Festival in Christendom, written in 1920, Walter Everett Hawkins described the irony of those calling themselves Christian with the act of a lynching scene. They bored hot irons in his side and reveled in their zeal and pride. They cut his quivering flesh away and danced and sang as Christians may. Then from his side they tore his heart and watched his quivering fibers dart. And then upon his mangled frame they piled the wood, the oil, and flame. And they raised a Sabbath song. The echo sounded wild and strong, a benediction to the skies that crowned the human sacrifice. We've been talking a lot lately about the pitfalls of outrage, about how we get stuck back in our little corners, our political corners, our social corners, our little things that we do, and, and we get so polarized. And we're just outraged about everything all the time. But there is a place for specifically what James Cone calls prophetic outrage. We're going to learn a little bit more the prophets in the coming, about the prophets in the coming weeks when we talk about Amos and Jonah in the next few weeks. But for today, let me just clarify the prophetic outrage is not the outrage of the barrage of tribal polarization that we find on the Internet. Prophetic outrage is one that forgets the poor, the, the oppressed, and those who, would consider, who we would consider the other. It's guided by those who would pray for wisdom, not for comfort, not for understanding, not for power, for those who would pray like Solomon. First comes wisdom, then comes justice. Our educational policies in Florida will not create wisdom and understanding. Therefore, it will not produce justice. We must not downplay the horrors of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And we must not downplay the suffering caused by the slave trade and Jim Crow era injustices or any of the myriad consequences as our nation continues to grapple with its history of racism. But there is hope. Because we're a people of resurrection, and we know that suffering can be redemptive. And we can be redeemed for, redeemed for this sin as well, but we are still somehow stuck in the three days of darkness after Good Friday. We haven't quite made it to Easter yet when it comes to this racism topic in America. So let's bring the life of Easter to this issue. Don't fall into the trap of blaming certain politicians or parties either. We all, as a people of the kingdom of God, must take responsibility to tell our state legislators and education department that these standards are unacceptable. Here's my letters. They haven't done any good yet. They're not in the mail yet. But you can do that. That's the thing you can do. If you don't know how to write it yourself, I've got a template. I can give it to you. All you have to do is put the sen your senator and a representative's name in it and mail it. Just let me know. Uh, that's one thing we can do, just for example. We all bear that cross. And as Martin Luther King said, the cross we bear precedes the crown we wear. And as Frederick Douglass said, power concedes nothing without struggle. As R Rabbi Joachim Prince who was a, who was a uh, um, refugee from Nazi Germany, he said, the most urgent and most disgraceful and most shameful and most tragic problem is silence. Is that enough quotes? One more. As Paul said in our reading today, what then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? May we all pray as we should, and Holy Spirit, fill in for us when our prayers are incomplete. Amen. Mm. Uh, thank you. But, you know, also I want to say, 
Uh, I actually just got this this uh, last night. I got this from, I was having a conversation with some of our conference um, folks from the Florida Conference and the United Church of Christ. I haven't talked to anybody in the Disciples of Christ yet, and I don't think I'm on all their mailing lists right now, so I haven't gotten everything from them. But last night I got a kind of an advanced copy of this letter that came out this morning. And it says, it, it's from John Vertigan, our conference minister. And it says, Dear Church, related action, recent actions by the Florida Department of Education have received both local and national attention as new standards for civics education in our schools seek to paint an incorrect and highly offensive picture of historic racism in our state and national history. You have heard or read about this, I'm rather certain, and, will not, and I will not offer space here to repeat what has been recounted elsewhere in, new, in a number of times. I will ask, though, from our scripture today, what then shall we say of this? As we seek to live into our identity as a United Church of Christ seeking a just world for all, we must raise a resolute voice in decrying the utter hypocrisy of these new so-called standards. And it goes on to, I don't know if this, I don't think this is just for clergy, but it goes on to uh, offer a Zoom uh, meeting where there's going to have people from all over the Florida Conference coming together and just talking about this issue, things that might be able to be done, to be done or just to process the issue, because a lot of the people are really finding this offensive. And that's Wednesday, August 2nd at 11 a.m.